Good afternoon. My name is Latif, and I will be your conference facilitator. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to Intuit Second Quarter Fiscal Year 2021 Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Kim Watkins and to its Vice President of Investor Relations. Ms. Watkins. Thanks, Latif. Good afternoon and welcome to Intuit's second quarter fiscal 2021 conference call. I'm here with Intuit CEO, Sasan Gadarzi and Michelle Clatterbuck, our CFO. Before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that our remarks will include forward-looking statements. There are a number of factors that could cause Intuit's results to differ materially from our expectations. You can learn more about these risks in the press release we issued earlier this afternoon, our Form 10-K for Fiscal 2020, and our other SEC filings. All of these documents are available on the Investor Relations page of Intuit's website at intuit.com. We assume no obligation to update any forward-looking statement. Some of the numbers in these remarks are presented on a non-GAAP basis. We've reconciled the comparable GAAP and non-GAAP numbers in today's press release. Unless otherwise noted, all growth rates refer to the current period versus the comparable prior year period, and the business metrics and associated growth rates refer to worldwide business metrics. A copy of our prepared remarks and supplemental financial information will be available on our website after this call ends. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Sasan. Thanks, Kim, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Second quarter results reflect strong momentum across the company. Small business and self-employed group grew double digits. Credit Karma performed very well, and we are very encouraged by our early results this tax season. We're on track for Intuit to deliver another year of double-digit revenue growth. We are confident our game plan to win is durable, accelerated by digital tailwinds given the pandemic. Our platform is well-positioned to help customers take advantage of a shift to virtual solutions, acceleration to online and omni-channel capabilities, and new ways to reduce debt and save money. The velocity of our innovation is helping our customers at a time when they need us most and positions us to accelerate growth in light of these structural and behavioral changes. We closed the acquisition of Credit Karma on December 3rd and welcomed 1,300 Credit Karma employees to the Intuit family. We bring together a large customer base of 110 million Credit Karma members and 57 million Intuit customers to help them unlock smart money decisions. Credit Karma's data platform creates powerful network effects through personalized financial offers, benefiting members and partners while adding a new monetization engine to Intuit. We are off and running executing on our innovation roadmap, which I will touch on shortly. Since we're in the middle of tax season, let's start there. We're very confident in our strategy and momentum, extending our lead in the do-it-yourself category and transforming the assisted segment. We're making great progress serving fast-growing, underpenetrated Latinx, self-employed, and investor segments. This season, we also expanded our free eligibility to better serve customers receiving unemployment benefits. We continue to aggressively transform the assisted segment by reshaping how 86 million filers can get their maximum refund with confidence virtually. We feel great about how the season is progressing. Let me now shift to our big bets. We're seeing strong momentum and in accelerating innovation across the business with our AI-driven expert platform strategy and five big bets. These big bets are focused on the largest problems our customers face and represent durable growth opportunities for Intuit. I'll highlight our progress covering big bet number one last as it accelerates innovation across our platform and is foundational to the other bets. Our second big bet is to connect people to experts. We're solving one of the largest problems our customers face, lack of confidence, by connecting people to experts virtually with TurboTax Live and QuickBooks Live. With TurboTax Live, we're transforming the $20 billion assisted category by providing 86 million filers the opportunity to access tax experts on our platform. We continue to lead the way in shaping the category, helping customers understand how to get their taxes done in a new way with our marketing campaigns and for a limited time, offering free live expertise to filers with very simple returns to attract them into the category. 
We have significantly improved the TurboTax Live platform by making it easier for customers to access an expert throughout the filing experience. And now, with our innovative full-service offering, our customers can hand off their return to an expert who will prepare and file it for them. We continue to make progress with QuickBooks Live, which is built on the same expert platform. Entering our second peak this season with QuickBooks Live, our customer base has doubled from a year ago and retention rates are improving. Although it's early days for QuickBooks Live, we're confident in the long-term opportunity to penetrate non-consumption. Our third big bet is to unlock smart money decisions. We're making progress towards our goal of creating a personal financial assistant that helps consumers find the right financial products, puts more money in their pockets, and access to financial experts and advice. Our strategic focus is to grow the core, including credit cards and personal loans, expand growth verticals, including home loans, auto loans, and insurance, and develop emerging verticals focused on money innovation, including savings and checking accounts. As we make personalized financial offers to customers across our platform, Credit Karma provides an additional monetization engine, increasing our combined wallet share with both free and paying customers. We've made great initial progress combining our capabilities to fuel success of the Credit Karma platform. First, to create a complete financial profile for existing and prospective members with customer consent, we've combined income data from 26 million TurboTax returns with Credit Karma. The combination of verified income data with credit history will enable Credit Karma to better personalize offers, driving engagement, and creating a win-win-win for our members, partners, and us over time. This enables us to grow in our core verticals for credit cards and personal loans, and growth vertical for insurance and mortgages. Second, we integrated Credit Karma money into the TurboTax filing experience, providing approximately 36 million TurboTax customers the ability to deposit up to 88 billion of tax refunds into a no-free checking account. And third, we're migrating Turbo users to Credit Karma. We're very excited about the journey ahead of us. Our fourth big bet is to become the center of small business growth by helping our customers get paid fast, manage capital, pay employees with confidence, and grow in an omni-channel world. 60% of small businesses struggle with cash flow, and we're innovating with velocity to create solutions for customers to overcome this challenge. We're making it even easier for customers to get paid fast with tools like payment-enabled invoices by auto-enabling new customers to accept payments immediately, increasing our charge volume. We continue to innovate with Cash, a small business bank account that helps our customers manage working capital by providing visibility into their full financial picture, along with the ability to move money instantly and ensure their money is working for them, while taking advantage of the built-in accounting of QuickBooks. We integrated bill pay into the offering this quarter. We're seeing growing adoption and active use of QuickBooks Cash, including a meaningful increase in activation rates. Making good progress with QuickBooks Commerce launched last September. QuickBooks Commerce is designed to better serve the 1 million product-based businesses on our platform and 6.4 million product-based businesses in our core market. The offering provides inventory and order management tools small businesses need to grow their businesses in an omni-channel world. We continue to add new partner integrations, enabling a streamlined experience. We're further bolstering the offering with the acquisition of OneSaaS in early February. OneSaaS is an infrastructure platform that integrates data streams from multiple sources of e-commerce platforms. This will help our customers see a complete view in QuickBooks. It's still early for both QuickBooks Cash and QuickBooks Commerce, but we're encouraged by what we're seeing. Our fifth big bet is to disrupt small business mid-market with QuickBooks Online Advance. The features we're introducing individually tailor the offering to the needs of small businesses with 10 to 100 employees at a disruptive price point. We continue to build out the offering and innovate to better serve these mid-market small business customers by adding more deeply integrated partners important to both acquisition and retention. And finally, our first big bet, revolutionize speed to benefit, enables us to put more money in our customers' pockets, eliminate friction, and deliver confidence at every touch point by using AI and customer insights. In TurboTax, we're leveraging advanced models to proactively offer customers the right resources at the right time to keep them engaged and give them confidence to file their taxes. 
And then QuickBooks Advanced, we're using AI to detect anomalies in price and quantity on customer invoices, saving our customers time and frustration of having to resend an invoice. Our live offerings are benefiting from a common AI platform that's creating efficiencies at scale, driving profitable growth. Across all of our big bets, we're building momentum and accelerating innovation, which we believe positions us well for durable growth into the future. I'm excited about the opportunity we have ahead of us, and I'm proud of the progress we're making as a team. Now let me hand it over to Michelle. Thanks, Hassan. Good afternoon, everyone. For the second quarter of fiscal 2021, we delivered revenue of $1.6 billion, GAAP operating loss of $25 million versus operating income of $270 million last year. Non-GAAP operating income of $235 million versus $384 million last year. GAAP diluted earnings per share of $0.07 cents versus $0.91 cents a year ago. The GAAP earnings include a $30 million gain from the sale of a note receivable that was previously written off. And non-GAAP diluted earnings per share of $0.68 cents versus $1.16 last year. Turning to the business segments, Consumer group revenue declined 71% in Q2, driven by the later IRS opening this year. We continue to focus on our strategy to expand our lead in DIY and transform the assisted segment with TurboTax Live. We remain confident in our plans and guidance of 9 to 10% growth in fiscal 2021. Turning to the ProConnect group, revenue declined 8% in Q2, reflecting a delay in forms availability. In the small business and self-employed group, revenue grew 11% during the quarter, while online ecosystem revenue was up 22%. Our strategic focus within small business and self-employed is to grow the core, connect the ecosystem, and expand globally. Our longer-term expectation remains 30% or greater online ecosystem revenue growth, driven by 10 to 20% growth in both customers and ARPC. First, we continue to focus on growing the core. QuickBooks online accounting revenue grew 22% in fiscal Q2, driven mainly by customer growth and mix shift. We lacked a full quarter of a price increase last year, driving slower year-over-year growth versus last quarter. Second, we continue to focus on connecting the ecosystem. Online services revenue, which includes payments, payroll, time tracking, and capital, grew 20% in fiscal Q2. Within payments, revenue growth reflects continued customer growth, along with an increase in charge volume per customer. Within payroll, we continue to see revenue tailwinds during the quarter from a mix shift to our full service offering and growth in payroll customers. Third, our progress expanding globally added to the growth of online ecosystem revenue during fiscal Q2. Total international online revenue grew 44%. The slower growth from last quarter was driven by lapping price increases a year ago and the lingering impact from lower retention and customer acquisition at the beginning of the pandemic. Desktop ecosystem revenue declined 2% in the second quarter, in line with our expectations for the business to decline longer term. Within this, QuickBooks desktop enterprise revenue grew mid-single digits. Small businesses are resilient, and we continue to help them put more money in their pockets when they need it most. We're pleased to see most QuickBooks indicators are back to or better than pre-pandemic levels. This includes growth in customer acquisition, the number of companies running payroll, and payments charge volume. This reinforces the digital tailwinds and positioning of our platform and big bets Sasan touched on earlier. We closed the acquisition of Credit Karma on December 3rd resulting in revenue of $144 million for the partial quarter. Our strategic focus with Credit Karma is to grow the core of credit cards and personal loans, expand growth verticals, such as home loans, auto loans, and insurance, and develop emerging verticals focused on money innovation, including savings and checking accounts. I'll share more detail on each of these strategic focus areas. First, Our focus is growing the core. We're seeing new credit card and personal loan partners onboarding while overall partner activity continues to recover. Adoption of the industry-first light box continues to grow. 
Lightbox enables Credit Karma to more tightly integrate with its financial partners, which helps match members to the products that are right for them. This now represents approximately 40% of credit card transactions and approximately 30% of personal loan transactions, up substantially year over year. Second, our focus is expanding growth verticals. Although it's early days, we're seeing strong growth in auto insurance, followed by home loans and then auto loans. January revenue in the growth vertical is up over one and a half times year over year. It's a high water mark. During the quarter, we introduced Karma Dry, providing members an easy opportunity to qualify for an auto insurance discount based on actual driving habits. Third, our focus is developing emerging verticals, particularly money innovation, and we're just getting started with Credit Karma money. Turning to our financial principles, we remain committed to growing organic revenue double digits and growing operating income dollars faster than revenue. As I've shared before, as we lean into our platform strategy, we're starting to see the opportunity for faster margin expansion over time, and I'm proud of the progress the team is making. We take a disciplined approach to capital management, investing the cash we generate in opportunities that yield an expected return on investment greater than 15%. We continue to focus on reallocating resources to top priorities with an emphasis on becoming an AI-driven expert platform. These principles remain our long-term commitment. Our first priority for the cash we generate is investing in the business to drive customer and revenue growth. We consider acquisitions to accelerate our growth and fill out our product roadmap. We return excess cash that we can't invest profitably in the business to shareholders via both share repurchases and dividends. We finished the quarter with approximately $2.7 billion in cash and investments on our balance sheet. We repurchased $175 million of stock during the second quarter. We have approximately $2.2 billion remaining on our authorization and we expect to be in the market each quarter this year. The board approved a quarterly dividend of 59 cents per share payable April 19th, 2021. This represents an 11% increase versus last year. Moving on to guidance, while macro uncertainty continues, we remain confident in how our business is performing in the current environment. Our guidance for third quarter fiscal 2021 includes revenue growth of 53 to 55%, GAAP earnings per share of $5.85 to $5.95, and non-GAAP earnings per share of $6.75 to $6.85. You can find our full Q3 and reiterated fiscal 2021 guidance details in our press release and on our fact sheet. With that, I'll turn it back over to Sasan. Great. Thanks, Michelle. I'm very proud of our team and all we've accomplished together, and I'm very optimistic about the future. So with that said, let's now open it up to your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Our first question comes from Scott Schneeberger of Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Right, thanks very much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to hone in on tax since we're in that season. And um, I'm just very curious on um, if you're seeing any activity um, pick up from all the new new brokerage accounts opened in 2020, if you're seeing a lot of activity in, um, in, in, in your tax business from uh, corresponding tax reporting from that, and just, Sasan, a few thoughts on that. Is that is that going to trigger more volume, or do you think it's more likely something that would trigger an increase in the revenue per return since um, since such transactions might uh, might come in at the uh, at a at a higher tier of uh, offering? Thanks. Thank you for your question, uh, Scott. You know, if I would take you back to what we de- declared several years ago. Uh, one element was underpenetrated segments. Uh, the investment community was one, of course, self-employed and Latinx. And the other element, of course, is about transforming the assisted segment, which also helps us serve uh, that community well if they need expertise or if they want us uh, to do their taxes for them. 
And and what I would tell you, you know, we all see the same stats. There's been really a, a um, significant increase in retail investors uh, using all the different tools that are out there, and not just in the United States, but you know, particularly in Brazil, India, and and the U.S. and so I feel good that we're very well uh, positioned, um, and all of those segments that I mentioned, Latinx, self-employed, and Premier, we are actually experiencing the kind of growth that we uh, expected, uh, and probably you know a tick up on uh, our Premier offering, which really serves our uh, investment community. So we we are experiencing an accelerated growth, and it's really all sort of in context of what we. Uh, had declared, and we'll have to see how the season plays out and, you know, when we tally up our results, what it all looks like. But we're very, very pleased with the fact that we really positioned ourselves to serve the segment a few years ago, and I think we're positioned well for for delivering for them this season, both with live platform and if you want to do it yourself. Thanks. I appreciate that, Susan. And then then staying on taxes, I'm just curious, kind of a high-level question, and, and, and you get this throughout the preseason, but now we're into the tax season. What type of um, federal turns do you expect this year versus last year? I saw recently that, that Texas, because of what's gone on there in the last couple of weeks, has gotten a delay to June 25th. So with that into account and then just the long tax season last year, a, a condensed for most states tax season this year, what are you expecting um, just for an industry growth year over year and uh, anything that you're seeing in the early season um, to, to support that view? Thank you. Sure. You know, a couple of things that I would say. One, you know, the assumptions that we made coming into this tax season uh, is that IRS returns, uh, you know, would be sort of flattish. Uh, and we expect to be able to, you know, grow um, our share of the total uh, number of returns. And, particularly because of our focus uh, on the underpenetrated segments that I mentioned and transforming the assisted segment with, with our uh, live platform. So really for us, it's about growing our share of the entire category. And as you know, we have such a massive opportunity with 86 million filers that today go to somebody else to do their taxes. Uh, and the, the fact that we have an opportunity to help them get their taxes done with a expert at their fingertips with any time that they need it. So, Really, our role is about growing the category and uh, in context of a, a flattish uh, IRS return. You know, all of our guidance just, you know, we made the assumption uh, that it's April 15th finish. You know, we contemplated uh, the, the Texas announcement that was made yesterday. We really, just looking at past uh, situations where there's been, you know, a disaster where IRS has um, extended the uh, – uh, the filing date, uh, the behaviors are very different. Net, net, we feel very good about our progress. We feel very good about our momentum and really good about, you know, the, the potential that we have this season in the context of the guidance that we provided. Thanks, Susan. I'll turn it over. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ken Wong of Guggenheim Securities. Your question, please. Great. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, this first one for you, Sasan, uh, also on tax. Um, as you think about TurboTax full service, not sure if you guys are starting to see some good traction there, but would love to get a sense of what kind of customers you're seeing utilize that particular product. Is it guys coming from accountants? Is it kind of net new filers who may have the greatest level of uncertainty? Um, you know, just across the board. A- any color you can give would be fantastic. Uh, sure, Ken. Good to hear from you. You know, it's important just to remind ourselves that we're, you know, in the assisted segment, the biggest problem that we're solving is confidence. Uh, These 86 million filers need to know that they can ask a question from an expert at any time that they need to and have the ability to turn over their return if they so uh, choose. And we are are getting very good traction with full service, but it really plays, I would say, a halo effect. What customers want to know is that they can come in, uh, and if they choose to ask for help, that they can get it. And somewhere in the experience, if they choose to just say, here, let me give you all of my um, documents digitally, that we can do it for them. Or even if they choose to make that choice up front. So full service beyond the actual number of customers that will end up using uh, full service really is playing a halo effect, which is what we learned in our test results last year. Uh, it really builds confidence uh, for filers that uh, come in from the assisted category that I can get my questions answered. There's always going to be an expert at my side. And as a reminder, last year, you know, we, we experienced 70% uh, plus growth in, in TurboTax uh, Live. 
and a majority of, of those customers actually came uh, from the assisted category. So it's playing the role exactly as we had assumed uh, that it would. And so far, so good this season in terms of the traction that we're getting. Great, great. That's uh, that's super helpful. Uh, and then a quick one for you, Michelle. You touched on on Lightbox um, and seeing, you know, I think, forty uh, percent uh, of transactions, thirty percent of personal loans. Just wondering, kind of, where do you think those numbers could trend up to? And then, as far as monetization, any any color on kind of how monetization has improved for customers that are utilizing Lightbox? Hey, Ken, thanks for the, the question here. Um, you know, Lightbox is, is a great technology that really is um, enables us to have a, a winning experience for both the customer and for our partners, uh, our financial institution partners, as well as us. Um, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than for a customer to come in and, and not be able to get access to a financial product that they thought they would. And so it enables the um, financial institutions to be able to better target the products that they have, and then customers um, are much more likely to actually be approved. So, um, you know, with with the metrics that we have right now, you know, we'll have to see how those trend over time. Um, we're very excited about it. We want to continue to have, you know, more and more transactions go through Lightbox because, as we said, it's a better experience for the customer, and it also is a better experience for um, our partners. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brad Zelnick of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much for taking questions. Um, Sasan, we, we heard from Michelle's comments that many of the small business indicators, such as customer acquisition, number of companies running payroll, uh, payments, charge volumes, things like that, are, are all trending positively. Can you maybe expand a little bit more on the indicators that you're looking at in terms of small business health and from your perspective, kind of where we are in terms of small business recovery? Yeah, sure. You know, let me start, Brad, uh, with the actual, you know, recovery. Depending on the geography, United States versus UK or different states within the U.S., every geography is performing differently. And just to use an example, we've got places like Florida, Texas, Arizona, Georgia, that have actually recovered quite nicely. And then you have places like Michigan, Washington, California, New York that are lagging. And then within that, you have industries that have come back all the way and industries that haven't. And then it's the, the natural ones that you would assume. It's fitness, restaurants, uh, travel. I bring that up uh, in context of yet another data point, which is when we look across the data points that we see, you know, about uh, 25% of our customers, their, you know, net dollars in their bank account is down uh, nearly 50%. So I give you those data points just to say that small businesses are still working hard to come back to where they were, and they're not all the way back. That's really important context relative to how our trends uh, are, are doing and what you heard from Michelle, which is, you know, we watch acquisition, we watch retention, of course, uh, we watch our uh, payments charge volume, the number of companies running payroll, the number of employees uh, per company using payroll, uh, time tracking, uh, et cetera. And all of those indicators are at or above uh, pre-COVID uh, levels, except the number of employees at small businesses. And that really tells you a lot about just the innovation that's happening on our platform, the power of our platform, and the fact that in times where small businesses are actually doing worse than they were uh, prior to COVID, our actually platform metrics are at or better than pre-COVID. And so that actually really bodes well for us to not only deliver for our customers, but the growth rate that we would expect uh, as we look ahead. So good momentum and actually bullish about where, where we are and the opportunities uh, for the future. Thanks, Hassan. That's very helpful. And maybe just a follow one for Michelle. Um, Credit Karma is off to a really strong start, and you're now just migrating Turbo users over, and you've got so many growth opportunities ahead that you've talked about in your remarks. Can you just remind us perhaps of, of the seasonality of this business? Because if we just start annualizing the last two months, it, it, I think we'd all be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. What should we keep in mind relative to what we've seen out of the gate versus what you're guiding for the full year? Yes. Um, thank you, Brad. Good question. Um, you know, we are off to a strong start with uh, Credit Karma. 
feel really good about um, the progress that they're making. We're seeing the business bounce back, um, you know, more quickly from the pandemic than we had ex expected, you know, not all the way back to pre-COVID levels, um, but definitely making progress there. When you think about seasonality in the business, you know, they do see a little bit stronger in the, you know, January, February time period, but um, there isn't huge seasonality in the business. Um, but I would say in January, February is, is a little bit more of an uptick, um, you know, as people are coming into the new year and some of those new year resolutions and so forth. But um, that's what I would say uh, you guys should expect. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our uh, next question comes from Keith Weiss of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you guys for taking uh, the question. And, and very nice quarter. Um, I, I wanted to expand a little bit on, on, on Brad Zelnick's question. Can you help us understand, um, now that the, the indicators are at or above kind of like the pre-crisis levels, how should we think about the mechanism of – how those um, indicators and, and the time frame for when those indicators will translate into kind of the revenue growth rates that you guys have guided to longer term and that, that we're, we're expecting. So, like, how should we moderate our expectations on to how quickly do indicators become sort of the actuality in terms of what we see on the income statement? Yeah, thanks for your question, uh, Keith. And, you know, in context of being a subscription business, a lot of the growth rate you're, we're experiencing uh, now uh, is, you know, the things that were happening almost a year ago uh, this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in context of, you know, slower acquisition, retention, uh, dropping a couple of points, you know, starting in March of, of last year. And also, you know, there are a number of things that have huge benefit for customers that we paused, you know, things like uh, the payroll full service uh, migration, uh, we have a line for where you have to upgrade to QuickBooks Advanced. Uh, we uh, sort of uh, dropped that line for a while. So it was the combination of acquisition, uh, retention, along with very intentional decisions we made around pricing and, and migration that has had an impact on the growth rates that uh, uh, we're seeing now. And, and, and in addition to all of that, we're lapping price increases that we had done the same time uh, last year. So the long answer to your short question is, you know, what we are starting to see now, you know, we should expect uh, the growth rates uh, to be impacted, you know, in the year ahead, because a lot of the metrics and the trends that we're experiencing now, uh, we'll, we'll see the, the follow-on benefit uh, in the quarters ahead. But I would say almost think about a year out or so is the way, is the best way to think about it. Got it. Got it. And, and if I could ask a follow-up to, to Michelle on, on the margin side of the equation, um, really appreciate the, the, the continued um, kind of balance between good growth and, and uh, factor margin expansion over time. It's great to see, see that as part of the corporate philosophy. This quarter in particular, um, we saw the SMB contribution margin up nicely on a year-on-year -year basis. But I know a lot of companies are talking to us about kind of one-time items or, or, or sort of crisis-related expense savings that we saw in the year past that might not uh, um, sustain the year forward. Anything we should be aware of in terms of sort of expenses that might come on board that could upset or not upset, but but could um, temporarily sort of reverse the margin expansion that we've been seeing? Um, you know, our, our thanks for the question, um, Keith, first of all. Um, you know, for us, as, as we've been thinking about margins and margin expansion, really the biggest driver of any of that is us becoming more and more of an AI-driven expert platform. And so you may see some expenses here, there, and obviously you see margins move around a little bit quarter to quarter. Um, but I would, I would say really focus on our guidance, which is, you know, after last year, expanding margins a point. This year, we expect margins to expand approximately 110 basis points, you know, once you're excluding Credit Karma. Um, and that is really us continuing to evolve to being more of a platform company and seeing those areas for us to drive margin expansion across the company. Um, everything from, you know, technology to customer success to go to market. And so that is the biggest driver of margin expansion for us um, um, across the company. Outstanding. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sterling Audi of J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. 
Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. I think in some of the prepared remarks and press release, there was the talk of the cross-sell of TurboTax going to Credit Karma, but I'm wondering what the expectations are in terms of the cross-sell and marketing that you could do to Credit Karma users for TurboTax for this tax season. Yeah, sure, uh, Sterling. You know, let, let me just, if I could, um, take it up one notch, and I'll come back specifically and answer your question. You know, there are a number of things uh, that uh, we have uh, launched. Uh, we've launched Credit Karma money at the end of the uh, TurboTax uh, experience. We're migrating, you know, Turbo customers that, that with Turbo being deprecated to uh, Credit Karma. And, of course, then, you know, to your question, uh, launching uh, TurboTax uh, as part of the Credit Karma platform. So there are a number of big things that we're doing, and all of them, Sterling, I would think about them as long-term opportunities with our focus being testing and experimenting right now to really nail uh, the experience. So I wouldn't expect uh, really you know, big impacts from those in the near term, but we do expect these to deliver significant customer benefit uh, and growth uh, in, the, uh, in, in the future because we're really just testing and experimenting. We want to really nail the experience before we you know, launch things at scale. So hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Cash Rangan of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, hey, thank you very much. Congratulations on the quarter. Uh, Susanna, the analyst you talked about a uh, twenty billion, twenty-four billion dollar U.S. tax opportunity, uh, and um, and wondering what have you learned from uh, live. And what are the things that uh, that you need to add to live in terms of capabilities to be able to address this uh, in, a, in a in a larger scale? And also in the same vein, as you look at uh, QBO Advance, what are the things that you've learned with that product out at the higher end of the of the SMB market that you've trad traditionally played in? And wh what are the things that you're looking to introduce in that product to make it address uh, the full breadth of the term? Thank you so much. Sure, Cash. Good to hear from you. Let me let me start with with live uh, and and the 86 million uh, customers that today uh, you know go to an assisted method. You know, based on research and work that we did several years ago, one of the the learnings that we had is over 70 million of these 86 million customers are actually willing to use a digital platform as long as they can get uh, help and expertise to be able to uh, file their taxes with confidence. And in fact. They would like to get help beyond taxes, which is where, you know, Credit Karma uh, comes in. And so to your, to your question of, you know, what, what we have learned, you know, with our uh, beginning, our fourth year with the, the live platform, you know, we're more bullish about the opportunity ahead of us than we were even four years ago uh, when we launched TurboTax Live. Uh, because in essence, you know, what we've learned and, that, and that's informing what we're executing this season is, is one, we have 86 million folks that we need to uh, get to consider uh, the fact that there's a digital platform with an expert at their fingertips and uh, the fact that they can actually hand everything off digitally for an expert, which is where you see what we're doing in our marketing campaigns. And you may only see what we're doing, you know, off air on TV, but we've got an incredible campaign in educating our customers uh, in multiple different uh, digital uh, channels to help them understand how this works because we're really, you know, shaping and reshaping uh, the category. So one is about uh, education, uh, which is where a lot of our investment uh, is going. The second is when they come in, really nailing the first-time use, you know, immediately when they come in to help them understand how to get access to an expert, engaging with an expert, ex exchanging a document visually and seeing how easy it is. And then with now the launch of a full service, if you choose to upgrade the full service or if you come in uh, and choose full service, how do we deliver instant benefit to you? And instant benefit, by the way, is confidence, that there's an expert there. Now, which gets me to the other side of the equation, which I haven't mentioned, and that is our expert platform. You know, that's really where we have advantage. A lot of our AI investments are actually improving our expert platform around scheduling, document uh, exchange, um, making sure that we connect the right expert uh, to the right customer, ensuring that we deliver insights uh, to the expert because of our machine learning capabilities so that when the expert is talking to the customer, it actually they deliver confidence with their know-how and, and their knowledge. 
And then being able to, by the way, the culture we're creating with the experts that we have on our platform that love the intuitive culture, the income that they make, and, and love the fact that they get to deliver uh, for our customers, you know, in the comfort of their home. So those are the areas that, that we are focused on. And frankly, every day in season, we learn and we, uh, we adjust and, and we, uh, you know, we love our momentum and, uh, and the opportunities ahead. And, you know, what we'll learn over time is, you know, we're launching TurboTax Live as part of the Credit Karma platform. And what's unique uh, in launching that as part of the Credit Karma platform is we'll actually be able to deliver a personalized experience because we'll know that you were a prior year um, assisted uh, customer. And that, again, will pay off in the long term. But those are the things that we're testing uh, now. In terms of your question around disrupting in the mid-market with uh, QuickBooks Advance, I mean, there's a couple of things that we've learned. Frankly, we believe that we can even go higher in the market beyond 10 to 100 employees. Now, our focus right now is 10 to 100 employees. But as we see the power of our platform and uh, the ability for it to scale, uh, we believe that we can actually serve, um, you know, even bigger mid-market uh, customers at a disruptive price. And, you know, to your question, the things that we're continuing to add are things around, like, workflow management, automated invoice approval, uh, batch invoicing, uh, getting um, very deep uh, integrations of critical apps uh, that are, these customers need to be able to grow their business and, and run their business, some of which uh, Michelle actually mentioned in the script around uh, like DocuSign, HubSpot, Salesforce uh, is just a few uh, examples. Uh, and, and every day we're learning uh, what we need to add to the platform. But it's a lot of what we do today, just a much, much higher uh, scale. And the confidence it's given us is not only being able to go up market, but we're actually, you know, we have now 70% uh, of the customers that we're getting are upgraders and 30% that are new to the franchise. And we're actually seeing our new to the franchise growing even at a faster rate than what we thought without the, the focus uh, yet in place to be able to go after new to the franchise. So those are the, the few elements that I think are, are worth uh, sharing cash. Very insightful. Thank you so much, Stefan. Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Brent Thiel of Jeffrey. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Back on, on small business, uh, I just wanted to drill on. There were a handful of investor questions related to your comments around the pipeline, yet Q1 to Q2, the, the growth rates decelerating in small business. I think many believe that they would stabilize or, or build. Uh, and, and I just want to make sure we're, we're truly understanding this, that many of the, the comments that you're – or color that you're seeing in, in the pipeline and close rates and things behind the scenes are showing a, a much better growth rate than what that – reported numbers indicating and I just I just want to make sure if there's any anomalies or any any differences that uh, the investors should be aware of uh, there's a number of questions just to, to disconnect from the comment relative to the reported number thanks yeah sure sure Brent you know one of the things that we've been pretty consistent in communicating uh, is that uh, our growth rates would uh, decline uh, sequentially before they start bouncing and, and going back up and that's really what we saw in Q2 is very consistent with what we expected. And, and it's consistent with what we expected on, on a couple of fronts. One, because, you know, this time last year or starting in March for, you know, several months, both acquisition slowed, but also um, our attrition popped. But in addition to that, uh, there are uh, things that, as I mentioned a few moments ago, that we paused, like full service migration. Uh, we, we paused our QuickBooks um, advance um, lineup uh, for those upgraders that we didn't ask them to move up because we didn't want to uh, have them experience that in, uh, in, in the early uh, COVID times. And so what, what, you're, what we're experiencing now is just a reflection of some of those key indicators that we experienced um, earlier uh, in the year. Uh, and we are on top of that uh, lapping a price increase uh, that we did last year that we didn't do uh, this year. So you put all of that together. We're actually quite pleased with the growth rate uh, that we uh, experienced in the quarter, uh, although we expected it to be lower than the last quarter. And then as we look ahead, as I mentioned, in the coming quarters and, and year ahead, a lot of the indicators that Michelle and I shared will start turning into uh, revenue growth. But everything is per our expectation. I think the only thing that's not per our expectation is the business is actually performing better than what we thought in the pandemic. And that, therefore, we're bullish about the future. Great. Thanks, Hassan.
You're very welcome, Brent. Our next question comes from Kurt Matern of Evercore ISI. Your question, please. Ah, uh, yes. Thanks very much. Actually, Susan, I want to actually maybe it's from Michelle. Just to per Brent's question, didn't you get four points of benefit from the PB, PPP program last quarter in your 24%? So if we sort of normalize, and I guess did you have any this quarter? Because if you normalize for that, you would actually have accelerated from you know, doing the math right from 20 to 22 this quarter. So I, I guess just can you talk about the PPP um, program helped the uh, QBO ecosystem at all this quarter? Yeah, I would, in a headline, what I would say, oh, Michelle, please, go ahead. No, that's okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, Kurt, actually, um, the PPP revenue that we got, um, that was actually in Q4, we saw that. Um, and so we did have about a four-point decline, if I'm, my memory serves me correctly, for a 28% um, online ecosystem revenue growth in Q4, which then dropped to 24 in Q1, and that was um, that actually had uh, PPP in it, but we didn't okay. have the anything material in Q1. Okay, that, that's fine. I just want to double check that. It, but Susan, I guess just sort of on the small business, another question would be on the international growth. Clearly, the UK was under a pretty severe lockdown for a lot of this quarter. Did, did that impact you all at all? Like, uh, international growth is still very strong in the in the mid 40s, but I was just kind of curious if that was one of the regions that perhaps you know, was still you know maybe taking a little bit longer time to recover. Thanks. Yeah, Kirk, it actually has. I mean, I would say if I uh, look at it um, across the globe, the United States has really not just bounced back nicely, but just the resiliency of our platform, the innovation on the platform is really uh, allowing us to see all the indicators uh, get back to or better than uh, pre-COVID levels. When we look at outside of the United States, um, countries like UK, uh, Australia, France, actually were hit much harder. And to your point, they're still uh, specifically UK and, and France in a lockdown. So that has uh, impacted uh, the growth rate uh, at relative to what we see in the in the United States, but all of that is within the you know the context of the the guidance that we uh, that we provided. But it has seen a hit. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Turin of Wells Fargo Securities. Your question, please. Hey there, thanks, and good afternoon. Um, going back to Credit Karma, it looks like that segment outperformed what we were expecting on the partial quarter. Looking at what's implied for the rest of the year, it, it looks like it's still below the, the billion dollars that business was at in 2019. Can we just go back to what some of the factors are that could drive outperformance from that beyond what's assumed in your current outlook? And then on the, the margin there, is the 26% segment margin there a good building block for us to be thinking about, or is the seasonality Michelle referenced somewhat impacting that number as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, good to hear from you, uh, Michael. Uh, just as a, as a quick refresher, there are three elements uh, around growth in Credit Karma. It's growing the core, which is credit cards and personal loans. Uh, it's expanding our growth verticals, which is um, auto and home loans and insurance. And then emerging verticals, which is really all around um, assets, which is money innovation. Uh, and, and none of this growth is really coming from that third uh, bucket. Uh, and the second point I would make is, we sort of have a 75-25, about 75% of the revenue uh, is coming from, you know, credit cards and personal loans and 25% coming from uh, the, uh, the growth verticals, which is um, auto and home loans and, and insurance, uh, which is actually really improved versus about a year ago where it was 95% uh, credit cards and, and personal loans. Uh, and so specifically with that context to answer your, your question, you know, we're seeing, you know, more partners come back on the platform. We're spent, we're seeing new partners come on. We're starting to see, you know, higher spend. And because of just the innovation with Lightbox and the better matching, we're getting more customers to actually get connected to the financial product that are right for them and partners uh, benefiting from it. So the, the, the performance we experienced this quarter is just we're, we're seeing um, stronger momentum when it comes to uh, credit cards, personal loans, uh, and then the uh, the growth vertical, specifically around um, auto insurance. And uh, and when we you know look ahead, our you know overall guidance uh, was just based on the trajectory that we assumed for the year, and we'll just you know have to continue to see 
how these verticals uh, play out, but we like the momentum uh, that we see. But that, you know, could be the reason in the long term for uh, overperformance to your question. Specifically around margin, really important to note that, one, we manage margins at the company level. And so really pay attention to the guidance that we provide at the company level. Two, you know, we are investing in credit karma. It is a – we see it in the long term as a big growth engine for the company – you know, the penetration, when you think about the 110 million members that Credit Karma has, penetration with all these different financial products that I mentioned is actually still quite low. So it's actually quite exciting, you know, as we look ahead, the, the possibilities of increasing penetration. And so we are investing uh, dollars uh, in Credit Karma, all within the context of the, the guidance and margin expansion guidelines that we have uh, provided. So I would get too anchored on the current quarter uh, margin rate, it was more because it performed better than what we thought, and some of the investments and hiring shifted between quarters. I would more focus on company level uh, operating income that we provided and margin rates that we provided. That's all very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Jennifer Lowe of UBS. Your line is open. Great. Thank you. Uh, maybe just first one quick clarification for me uh, relative to the question that Kirk asked earlier. Michelle, you clarified that, you know, Q4 had the PPP impact and by Q1 it, there wasn't one. Um, but given that that program reopened, I think, in earlier this calendar year, can you just confirm whether there was an impact in Q2? Um, no, Jen, you know, that program, the new PPP program has been um, moving, and you may have seen it in the in the press, it's been moving much more slowly than anyone had anticipated, and no, we don't have anything um, in the, anything in the material in the Q2 results. Okay. Perfect. And then that, just following on some of the questions around the trajectory in small business, um, you know, there's a couple different factors that you call, called out. There's first the fact that, you know, the economic indicators have improved, but maybe not everything is back to pre-COVID levels. And then there's also sort of this lagging effect from some of the subscription businesses or some of the pauses that you took um, as, as everyone sort of navigated a very uncertain time. So I just want to clarify, if you think about the 30% plus type aspirations for the online um, ecosystem component, is that something you can get back to in the current environment and it's just a function of working through some of these sort of leftover impacts from the last six to 12 months? Or do you need to see continued improvement in the broader small business economy as well to get back to the pre-pandemic levels to support that 30%? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, John, thanks for your question. Uh, uh, what I would say is, um, you know, the economic indicators are, are – uh, still below uh, pre-COVID levels. It's more our own indicators and the performance of our platform uh, that has bounced back, and in many cases, better than the, the pre-COVID levels, which gets, I think, the, at the essence of, of your question, and that is, you know, our goal in the long term has not changed. We, you know, we uh, believe that we will get this business, specifically the online revenue growth, back above 30%. Uh, and we just need to keep executing our game plan. And it, I would tell you that I, we don't think it's heavily relied upon uh, how the economy bounces back. Because if you look at where we are today versus, you know, six months ago, a lot of the performance that we are talking about is based on the performance of the platform and our execution and the innovation on our on our platform. Uh, now, at the end of the day, this economy does need, you know, a, a stimulus, fiscal stimulus to get people back into jobs. But that is not the anchor for us to get back to the growth rates that, that we believe we can get back to. It'll just take some time. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next question comes from Kartik Mehta of North Coast Research. Your question, please. Hey, Susan, when you look at the QuickBooks business, obviously you're lapping a price increase, but you haven't stopped innovation. I'm wondering what metrics you'll look at to feel comfortable uh, to adjust pricing. Yeah, Sardik, thank you for your question. You know, our um, our main focus around pricing will be when we believe it's the the, the right time, uh, given uh, how small businesses are performing and given uh, the pandemic. Uh, it is actually not related to our innovation. But as you know, we now have innovation that allows us to go up market with both QuickBooks Advanced uh, and QuickBooks Live, which is a much higher ARPU um, offering, 
uh, we have the ability uh, to garner higher price from customers. Uh, but from a price increase perspective, it's less about the um, metrics and indicators that we see with um, our own platform, but more when we believe, you know, is the right time to raise prices uh, with customers given, you know, what they're experiencing and the challenges that they're experiencing for their business. So the, the two are in many ways unrelated in terms of the way we think about it. And then just finally, uh, when you look at the credit card, a karma customers uh, as far as tax customers is the mix uh, of the products they're using different than the core turbo tax customers at least what you're seeing early on yeah what, what I would what I would share with you that we've learned about the the credit karma base is you know a, a big um, a big portion of their customers actually use an assisted method uh, and that is actually what is exciting to us. Now, because they have 110 million members, you know, you can imagine they have a, a strong cross-section of folks in the U.S., you know, whether Latinx, self-employed, uh, those that are retail investors. So that cross-section is generally consistent with the customers we serve in TurboTax today. Uh, what, what's different is, you know, we got a good majority of those customers that uh, in the prior year used an assisted, uh, assisted method. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep, you're very welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from CC Panagrahi of Mizuho. Your line is open. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I uh, wanted to uh, ask about the feedback you got from that uh, product-based businesses, mainly you know, QuickBook Commerce that you launched a few months back. Uh, that seems like that's an acquisition from TradeGecko, mainly has order in inventory. I'm wondering, like, how far are you can expand that offering? In, uh, you know, it feels like you can become the back office platform for uh, this kind of businesses. So what sort of opportunity you are seeing and what sort of feedback you got so far? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Siddhi. Uh, you know, first of all, we're very excited about QuickBooks Commerce, and it's also, you know, very, very um, early uh, innings with QuickBooks Commerce. Uh, and the the acquisition we just made with OneSaaS actually allows us to bring data into the platform uh, from marketplaces, from POS providers, you know, from uh, fulfillment uh, apps. And so it really actually helps us uh, help the customer understand how they're doing and their profitability, which is what's most important uh, to the customers. Uh, we actually had to restrict the top of the funnel uh, to ensure that we can nail the customer experience. And so our focus first was uh, ensuring that we can serve new customers that don't use our inventory today. Our next focus will be existing QBO customers that don't use uh, any of our inventory capabilities. And then third will be existing QBO customers that actually do use our current inventory capabilities. And the reason that's important is we want to ensure that um, if a customer already has inventory, that we can easily sync all the product catalogs and the product numbers and to keep their books uh, clean. So net-net, we're just getting started. Uh, we had to restrict the top of the funnel because of the demand and the excitement that was, that was out there because we want to be very intentional uh, in terms of building out the, the capability. Very early indicators are positive with the, the number of customers that we have on our platform. But, again, think about QuickBooks Commerce. Think about QuickBooks Cash as these are long-term plays in terms of uh, when and how they will uh, deliver growth. But so far, we're bullish about the early indicators. That's great. Thank you, Sessa. All right. Thank you, Siddhi. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brad Reback of Stateful. Your line is open. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Michelle, as we think about free cash flow generation over time, is there any reason it shouldn't closely mirror operating income growth? I'm, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, Brad? I, I didn't hear the last part of it. Sure. It, it, as we think about free cash flow generation over time, is there any reason it shouldn't mirror operating income growth? No, no. It, um, there shouldn't be any real big reason why you shouldn't see that. No. Okay, that's great. And then maybe one quick tactical one. So, Son, you talked about QuickBooks Live retention getting better. Is that meaningfully different than QuickBooks Online retention right now? Yeah, you know, the, the biggest thing, well, first of all, it's very early days, so the, the, we look at more cohort of customers versus the aggregate numbers. 
the, the biggest reason we're so focused on retention right now with Cookbooks Live is we're focused on um, understanding customer needs and really nailing the experience. Because with Cookbooks Live, there are customers that come in to get set up. There are customers that come in that want us to provide them advice, and they're just they're looking for bookkeeping advice. And there are customers that actually want us to do their taxes for them uh, and run their books for them. And what we're really uh, being intentional about is understanding what are the needs, what are the experience that we need to deliver, uh, and what does that look like uh, on the platform, which is why you heard me mention retention. Retention right now uh, is more focused on cohorts, and it is lower than QBO only because we're looking at different cohorts of customers and their needs are very different. And before we really open up the top of the funnel, we want to make sure that you know every customer loves the experience that they're getting from us on QuickBooks Live, and the team is just – innovating like crazy to close some of the gaps and so we're excited about the possibility. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Arvin Ramani of Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Um thanks for taking my question. I, I wanted to follow up on a on a question that was asked earlier around uh, kind of the increase in brokerage accounts. Um and uh yeah, you know, I just wanted to ask about potential lift from uh, from crypto users. You know, the, this will be the, you know the first time uh, uh, these users will need to to you know, some of them will be first time filers, but many of them will will certainly be adding the you know kind of the, the added product for capital gains or, or losses. Uh, are, you, are you seeing any kind of uh, lift uh, from from this segment of users? Yeah, Arvin, it's not particularly just from the crypto users. We're just, you know, there are just um, you know, millions more of customers that are uh, doing their own trading in the U.S. and outside the United States. And, and you know, come tax time, they need to be able to do their taxes. And, uh, and so we're just seeing a, a um, increase in our premier uh, product, both with live, because if you need assistance, you can use live. And if you want to do it yourself, you just use, uh, of course, our premier do-it-yourself product. So we're seeing an overall increase based on an increase in retail investing. I couldn't call out something that's material on the, on the crypto side. Great, great. And and uh, you know when you just think of, about you know the kind of the lift in revenues, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not looking for a specific quantification, but but directionally, you know, are, are you expecting more more of a lift from increased ARPU or or increased increased users? Yeah, you know, um, the, the way we um, designed our long-term growth rate is on the underpenetrated segments, which is investment community, self-employed, and Latinx, and it's TurboTax Live. Uh, and with TurboTax Live, you know, just by design, it has a higher um, ARPU. Now, right now, we are so early in the shaping of the category uh, and being able to acquire uh, customers, that the best thing, you know, for you all to anchor on is what we shared at Investor Day, which is our long-term expectations just on the tax side is 8 to 12%, and probably the largest driver of the higher end is ARPU. Uh, and just know that we're being very intentional about right now raising awareness, both with our campaigns, but the free expertise that we're providing uh, for those that have very simple returns just to create awareness in the category. But in the long term, it's our food because of the assisted segment. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, very welcome. Our next question comes from Michael Millman of Millman Research. Your line is open. Well, thank you very much. A uh, couple questions. You, talk, you mentioned that Craig Karma was getting some business uh, from assisted can you talk about uh, if, if that normal switching around between different methods or if this is a particularly a credit karma type business activity? Uh, secondly, uh, can you talk about, uh, and maybe you do this, whether you can use RALS to kind of speed up some of this movement, particularly from uh, assisted? And I guess... Um, well, well, let's start with those. Yeah, sure, Michael. Thank you for your, your question. The, the point I made earlier 
uh, was, was twofold. One, uh, that this is a learning year for us in launching TurboTax as part of the Credit Karma platform. And we're just running a lot of experiments to make sure that we can deliver a, a fantastic experience before we, you know, we go big in, in the out years. But the second comment that I made is that uh, that, you know, a, a good portion, we've not divulged the number of Credit Karma members, uh, use the assisted uh, assisted uh, segment. And it's very much, you know, uh, connected to when you look at there's 155 uh, or 160 million IRS returns, 86 million are um, in the assisted segment. You know, proportionality is the same thing uh, within the Credit Karma base. So that's the point that I was making earlier. To your second question about Rouse, really the biggest driver of getting a customer to use a digital platform is actually confidence and uh, not early access to the to their money. They have to first have confidence that they can get their taxes done right with you, which is where our experts and expertise comes in. And that's really where, you know, a lot of our investments are, are going. We also provide early access to your refund, but really the, the big driver is about ensuring that we deliver confidence to our experts. Do you see a big opportunity uh, added money to uh, move the confidence over to eliminating um, RAL kind of money? Yeah, well, well, first of all, you know, we're really focused on getting these uh, customers to come to our platform by ensuring that they know that they can uh, get access to an expert. So confidence is, you know, first and uh, and foremost. And, of course, there are different, you know, methods uh, that we can um, help uh, these customers get early access to their refund that's very, very uh, co consumer friendly. So the answer is yes, but it's secondary uh, to providing expertise to these customers to use the platform. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, Michael. And stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. You do the same. And thank you, everybody. I, I know we ran a little bit over. Appreciate everyone's uh, questions. Uh, I wish everyone well. Stay safe. Uh, until next time, we'll talk to you next quarter. Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating. This concludes today's conference call.